Managing Director, thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to speak principally about Africa, and I know that the fund has done a, a detailed study on the economic impact on Africa um, of the COVID crisis. Can you tell us how deeply damaged are these economies going to be? This is the uh, heaviest hit on Africa, uh, at least since the 70s. We are uh, predicting minus 3.2%, but for countries that are particularly exposed of the economic shock, the uh, devastation is more severe. Tourism affected countries, uh, minus 9.7%. Oil dependent economies, minus 4.9%. Commodity dependent in addition outside of oil, minus 4.2%. So when we look at the uh, devastation that this uh, crisis is causing everywhere, we have to recognize that it is particularly hard on Africa, especially given that Africa has been the continent on the move. It has gained momentum for growth and poverty reduction. And this momentum is now so dramatically interrupted. Now, if the world does nothing, what are the dangers for Africa? Some, for example, talk about the dangers of big defaults. Uh, people are talking about Zambia, Angola. Then there's, of course, the lack of money to actually fight the COVID crisis itself, which is in the fairly early stages yet. We don't know quite what's going to happen. Um, can you tell us what you think the dangers are and which countries are particularly vulnerable? Uh, what we already uh, uh, see is that uh, countries that have been building strong fundamentals and diversifying their economies are in a better position. Countries that are more dependent on one or two sectors and where levels of debt have gone up before the pandemic are in a much tougher place. Uh, when we look at the highest risks uh, for uh, Africa, I would place four on your uh, radar screen. The first and uh, more troubling uh, is the fact that the uh, uh, infections in Africa are growing. Uh, we now have uh, some uh, quarter of a million uh, people affected. And uh, uh, we see a number of countries, South Africa, Nigeria, big countries, Angola, being among the most affected. This is a tragedy, but it is especially harsh when medical capacity is limited. Second, we see risk of losing the gains in poverty reduction. Uh, I have said that we are seeing a shrinking, shrinkage of 3.2%, but on real income per capita, because of population growth, it is higher, it is 5.4%. What it means is that we are unfortunately recognizing this reversal of poverty reduction uh, already. The World Bank predicts 26 million people more in extreme poverty. And if the crisis is more protracted, that can go up to uh, 40 uh, million. Three countries that are under the burden of debt already. And we had uh, uh, some 16 uh, countries in sub-Saharan Africa, either in debt distress or close to debt distress. Uh, they're in a particularly uh, tough place. You mentioned uh, Zambia, uh, Angola is, uh, is facing uh, uh, similarly uh, significant difficulties, uh, but so do a number of other uh, countries. And this is where the uh, debt service suspension initiative is so important to help countries that are under this burden of uh, debt. And last but not least, the fourth uh, thing to watch is uh, how would economies that are most severely affected because they are tourism or 
commodity export dependent, how would they manage this next uh, year, two years, uh, given that uh, the rest of the world uh, is going to go through what uh, we describe in our, in our report, a uh, partial and uneven recovery in 2021. Now, um, given the nature of this economic challenge and given that this is really purely an exogenous shock that has nothing mm. to do with bad policies uh, in Africa specifically, some are saying that the world is not doing enough for Africa. The IMF has been singled out as actually doing something, but other institutions, um, uh, other countries are really being criticised by, um, by some African leaders. They say that hundreds of billions, even trillions, are being made available for the North, um, and mm. yet a few billion uh, for Africa, and they really need more. Mm. Are you at the IMF being too timid, given, given the need? Mm. Well, the uh, uh, IMF is uh, uh, leaning forward to support Africa in a very significant way. Uh, let me give you the numbers. On uh, average, we disburse about $1 billion in Africa. This year, so far, we have disbursed $10 billion, 10 times more. And we are on the way to add another six billion in support for Africa. And we have no intention to stop there. We are going to continue to seek ways in which we can increase support for Africa. But let me be very clear. Many of the countries need not more loans. They need more grants and they need certainly more concessional resources on a larger scale. At the fund, we have tripled our capacity to provide concessional financing, and we intend to increase this capacity even further. Uh, and I think uh, it would be fair to say that uh, if everybody does their part, we can support Africa much more significantly. We had a meeting designated to work with Africa exactly on this issue of the financial gap during our virtual spring meetings. At that time, we concluded that the financial gap for Africa was about $110 billion, and 44 of this $110 billion was still missing. So we see our duty to step up, and we would like to see others, especially those who can provide Africa with grant financing or space not to be serving debt as long as the economy is in this stand uh, still, so Africa can go to the other side and then rethink how they're going to uh, grow and uh, uh, provide uh, a chance for the enormous opportunities of Africa to materialize. Managing Director, where do you stand on SDRs, on special drawing rights? Um, there's been a lot of talk about this. Um, one is that um, some of the existing special drawing rights that belong to rich mm -hmm. countries be reallocated. Um, uh, I'm told that, that this would not be enough given that African countries only have a 6% quota of those. The other would be to um, issue new SDRs, perhaps a trillion dollar, uh, a trillion dollars worth of um, of SDRs. Um, do you favour that? Uh, uh, do the Americans favour that, or are they uh, pu pushing back against that uh, uh, that hope? So, uh, when uh, in March we had the um, uh, G20 heads of uh, states call, at that time, among the actions we needed to take to respond to this crisis, uh, I actually listed a possibility for a new SDR allocation. At that time, that was a very pressing issue because uh, shortage of liquidity across emerging markets in developing countries could have turned into insolvency. We are in a different place today because the tremendous provision of liquidity by major central banks, especially by the Fed, the European Central Bank, 
and others, and the enormity of fiscal measures taken by especially advanced economies made it possible for emerging markets with good fundamentals to raise money at a fairly low cost. We have seen a dramatic increase in bond issuance by emerging markets. This issue of access to liquidity for countries with strong fundamentals right now is not so pressing. However, however, for countries with weak fundamentals, for weak economies, for poor countries, it continues to be a very pressing issue. So where we are, we have not been able to uh, gather sufficient support for a new SDR issuance at this point. I wouldn't say this is off the table, but we need 85% uh, voting. We don't have it at this moment of time. And there are some reasons that, that are being stressed as to why this is not coming. But for poor countries, we are working on moving existing SDRs from countries that have it, don't need it, to countries that don't have it, but need it. And uh, this, is in, this, is, this discussion with the membership is progressing. Some people have said that there is a difference between the IMF and the World Bank here, that the IMF is keener to push ahead, to break the glass, as uh, one finance, put, uh, finance minister put it, i.e. To, to be more innovative and aggressive. Mm -hmm. The World Bank is more cautious and more conservative. And some people are very angry at this because they say, you know, this is not a time to be cautious. You have said spend now, but keep the receipts. But if you don't have the money, you can't spend. Is the World Bank being a break on what should, what should be happening? But the World Bank uh, is mobilizing uh, some $160 billion for this year and next to provide to countries uh, uh, supporting them in this uh, extraordinary uh, uh, environment. Where the fund is uh, perhaps uh, more unusually leaning forward uh, that we have been seeing in, in the past is in exactly that recognition that we are talking about an exogenous shock. And uh, the advice we are giving everyone, countries rich and poor, is put the floor under your economy so you can move to the other side, restore growth, and deal with the uh, consequences from this uh, crisis, higher debt, higher deficits, possibly uh, higher unemployment, possibly higher poverty. But unless you can go uh, through this period of time, then there can be very significant scarring that would have long-lasting, terrible consequences. So we are acting on our own advice by tremendously increasing provision of emergency financing. We have done in a short period of three months, uh, 72 programs. Never in the history of the fund we have done so much. 29 uh, of those are uh, for Africa, for African countries with more to come. And then we are stressing that it is critical to have strong accountability to the citizens because if we act on scale but lose the receipts, then we would see a backlash uh, from 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 uh, from the public, especially when we know when we know that there would be more difficulty, especially for poor people. Where do you stand on the issue of private debt? Because some are saying that mm -hmm. um, that that you, the fund, are are helping out countries with debt moratorium, um, but they will merely use that money to pay off uh, banks that have lent on the commercial markets to Africa. Mm -hmm. And yet, if uh, there is a moratorium on, on private debt, on euro bonds, et cetera, uh, the danger is that African countries will be downgraded by the ratings agencies. First of all, where do you stand? And do you think that the ratings agencies are being obstreperous? Do they need to be more helpful in saying, look, this is an emergency. If you, if you have a standstill, we won't count this against you. Just to give you a number that, that was a pretty uh, shocking number, when we decided to calculate how much would the world lose in these two years because of this uh, uh, pandemic and economic shock? The number is staggering. It is 12 
trillion dollars less. Okay, we should all have the interest to accelerate return to growth and then make it possible for everybody to have better opportunities. Now, of course, uh, if, when, we, when we talk to private sector, we recognize uh, that uh, they also have their own uh, constituency to report to. Uh, and yet I would really plead that it is in everybody's uh, interest. We are in this together. If there is anyone that hasn't quite yet gotten it, please wake up. Uh, and when it comes to when it comes to to to, uh, to rating agencies, uh, I mean, some uh, years ago the fund would say debt levels are going high. This is going to be a problem. That is not sustainable. The countries are in debt distress. But we would not see the same uh, concern uh, translate into into ratings. Now we are in a situation when uh, countries are being uh, hit by exogenous uh, uh, shock. Uh, well, it is fair to look at uh, this uh, situation and assess it as it is, highly unusual. Um, it, is, it is a crisis like no other. Uh, so I would, I would really hope that we would all be mindful that this is unprecedented and we have to be able to think to, through this crisis with an objective that we have a stronger, more resilient economy when you come on the other side. Is China doing enough? Uh, China signed on to the debt moratorium for Africa f until the end of the year. Um, but again, there's, there's concern, it's been expressed in Washington, that China will revert to norm. It will uh, negotiate uh, bilaterally, country by country, pick them off. And that in a sense, it may also free ride if the big institutions, if the big Western economies are have a debt standstill, um, are pushing money um, towards Africa, that China may continue to collect. What's your experience? What's your feeling about what yeah. China's doing? Well, uh, let, me, let me first recognize uh, that uh, the Debt Service Suspension Initiative is a huge achievement. Never before we had the Paris Club and the non-Paris Club official creditors coming together. They did it and they did it very quickly. And I want to uh, give my personal appreciation for everybody, for the uh, Gulf countries, for China, of course, for the pa Paris Club uh, countries. And if we are successful in this debt service suspension initiative, one might envisage that there could be official creditors forum that brings uh, all the key creditors together on common principles and in coordinated action. Uh, and that would be very good uh, for the future of uh, finance. China has taken this commitment uh, to heart. Uh, and uh, from what we see is they're recognizing that it may be necessary to do even more. Uh, President Xi Jinping uh, in the uh, summit with Africa spoke about possibly uh, prolonging this uh, uh, moratorium. And very important, he spoke about calling on all Chinese institutions uh, to participate. Uh, from the fund side, uh, we are working at the uh, senior technical level with China on, a, on, on the broader principles, but also country by country uh, where we see the, the um, a country headed in terms of debt sustainability, what may be necessary and what China's role uh, should be. Uh, so it is uh, critical. China has evolved to be a very big lender uh, to African uh, countries. They have multiple institutions that are participating, not necessarily it is uh, uh, at this point entirely clear how decisions are being uh, made uh, in the country. Uh, but if we are to be uh, successful, we have to come up to multilateral approach to debt sustainability. And uh, I, I certainly uh, would like to see uh, China playing its role in it. Just finally, I'd like to turn to a non-African question, really a global question. We're seeing many economies come out of lockdown now. 
And yet, if you look at the global numbers, uh, I'm talking about the COVID numbers, they're still going up. Uh, there's no real, um, uh, we have no real reason to believe that this is ending. People are talking about a second wave, but it's not really clear that the first wave has ended mm. yet. If we get, let's say, a spike or an upsurge uh, in COVID cases, have you done any kind of back of the envelope calculations as to how damaging, how low could the global economy go um, if we really don't get this uh, pandemic under control? Well, uh, when we publish our projections, uh, we did have um, upside and, and downside uh, scenarios. And the downside is indeed uh, if uh, measures to contain the pandemic uh, are less effective and uh, uh, if we are to have uh, either continuation of the uh, uh, infections uh, uh, with a high speed uh, or a second uh, wave. Uh, and what we uh, recognize is that um, it would be a much tougher uh, place for the world to be. Uh, let me stress uh, two points. Uh, one, where we are today is we understand somewhat better how the virus behaves and uh, what can be done to reopen responsibly while the pandemic is still with us. In April, we were still hoping that we would reopen after the pandemic is gone. Now we know this is not the case. And we know the measures that can be put in place. So it really is uh, upon uh, countries to take these measures to heart and act indeed responsibly. Uh, and secondly, we are at a time when uncertainty continues to be massive. Yes, I personally believe in our scientists. I think they will come true. There would be vaccines, there would be treatment. But when, how effectively, how fast, we don't know. And when we have such a high degree of uncertainty, then it becomes hugely important for policymakers to be agile, to be following developments and correcting, adjusting policies accordingly. And then we would be able to protect more lives and at the same time uh, protect our economies for deep uh, scarring. We are in a place where we are finally recognizing we live in a more risk-prone world. We have to change our mindset accordingly. Managing Director, thank you very much. Thank you.